This is the Gopher Puck Live podcast, episode number 10, recorded December 6th, 2011. Welcome to the GPL podcast, along with Hammy and Ryan Cardinal. I'm your host, Jupiter. Just a reminder, we record these podcasts on Tuesday nights around 9.30 or so, usually just a little bit after. And if you head over to the GPL podcast page, at that time you can listen to us live uh, as we record the podcast. And that allows us to take your questions via Twitter, you know, at GopherPuckLive or via email at podcast at GopherPuckLive.com. So tune in if you can. Well, let's get right to this, gentlemen. The Gophers sweep the visiting Mavericks from Mankato, but Hammy... It was not that easy, was it? No, I mean, you know, and I can't say that when I think about it, you know, Mankato's getting healthier. I think that, you know, after watching him this weekend and, you know, being able to see two games, granted the Saturday game was a mess because of the refs, but, you know, they're, I think, going to be a better team. And you, you want the Gophers to kind of take care of business a little bit more given we were first place and I think what going into this series, were they in last place or close to it? Um, but I think that their record and their, you know, is a little bit deceiving. And, uh, you know, that Saturday game was just a total mess. Um, I'm sure we'll get into some of that in a little bit. But uh, all in all, I guess you, you can't complain too much about two wins. Uh, they did what they were supposed to do. And I honestly thought it would be a tougher series and it kind of looked on paper. So all in all, I guess it's it's not a bad thing to come out of the weekend with four points. Yeah, I mean, not, uh, not too much more to add. I mean, I think, you know, you saw Minnesota State play the Gophers kind of the same way that Wisconsin, North Dakota did where, you know, they're not going to like St. Cloud, you know, try to run and gun with them and try to outscore them. But it was more of, you know, stack guys across the blue line, force them to dump the puck in and make them go get it. And, um, you know, to their credit, they executed that pretty well. I mean, they made it tough for the Gophers to get a lot of offensive flow going. And, um, you know, you saw the Gophers kind of bottled up to a degree. You know, you th- it seemed like on Saturday night they were going to kind of run away with things once they got out to the three nothing lead but you know like hammy said the refs and again both ways not just against the gophers um you know that game was a complete cluster due to some pretty poor officiating but um yeah like i said i mean give the mavericks credit they've been you know kind of a thorn in the gopher side i mean ever since that playoff series up until then the gophers had really dominated them and you know obviously the gophers came out ahead in that playoff series three or four years ago whatever it was now but since then i mean mankato's played them tough whether the gophers are really good like they are this year or whether it's you know been some of the you know more downtrodden gopher teams that we've seen over the last couple of years as well. So, um, yeah, but Mankato, I mean, like Hammy said, they're going to get a little bit healthier. And, you know, just with that, you know, brand of hockey they play, if they get the goaltending, um, you know, they could be a little bit tough. But, um, yeah, all in all, I mean, you can't complain getting four points at home. Well, let's get to the refereeing. I mean, there were calls that were pretty borderline. Then there was makeup calls that were just as bad. It seems like the refs were almost competing against each other to see how bad they could be. Um, you know, obviously coach Lucia was not very happy Saturday night. I just happened to be, you know, shooting, you know, from the photo box between the benches on the third period. And he, let's just you say he was very salty with his language and, uh, he was just not a happy camper. Well, I mean, the whole weekend, I mean, I didn't think Friday was, you know, badly reffed. I mean, the only thing that really bothered me that night was Mankato's second goal and, Marshall tried to clear the puck and they kicked it down, but then LaFontaine right after it just kind of tripped him from behind. And of course that created all that advantage and that big pile up in front of the net and whatever. But all, all in all, I didn't think Friday was, you know, all that bad as far as roughing goes, but Saturday was a total joke. I mean, it, it, like you said, like Ryan said, you know, it's, it wasn't just for the go you know, against the Gophers. It was both ways. You know, I, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to the ones on Mankato, but, um, you know, the goalie interference, like, for instance, on Bukestad in the first, I mean, he got checked into the goalie before he even touched him. So that's a joke. You got Larson for a hold where Dorr basically stops right in front of him and Larson's going full blast. Well, what the hell is the guy supposed to do? He didn't tackle him, for God's sakes. He was just trying to get out of the way. Um, you have Ben Marshall for interference. I mean, Wu brought it up on the broadcast. And even with common sense could tell you he wasn't trying to interfere with the guy. Um, Ralph for roughing in the third. I mean, he all he did was give him a hard check. There was no shot. It was shoulder to shoulder. I didn't hit him in the head. I mean, the slash that Hanson gave right afterwards, that was legit. 
I mean, that was a stupid play by Hanson. But, um, you know, roughing on all for a good check, calling Raul for embellishment on a cross check. I mean, give me a break. I don't know what the hell Adam and this other ref were looking at. And I don't honestly, for some of these checks, I don't know what is legitimate anymore. I mean, when I saw the two checks, like Rao and all being called for, I'm like, you know, I think Hankinson said on the broadcast a few years ago, you know, that wouldn't even be a penalty. So nowadays I don't even have an idea unless it's something directly to the head. I just don't have a clue anymore what a good check is. Well, you know, so, the, the Rao check, you know, that was close to the board. Well, it wasn't close to the board. I thought it was a good check. Um, I do believe the referee Walsh called that. And it was kind of scary at first because they were discussing it for a long time. I, I, I seriously wonder if he wanted to call something like a five minute on that. When I'm, I'm thinking that Don Adam might have talked him out of it because they were talking awfully long on that penalty, and I couldn't even believe it was a penalty. Yeah, well, I don't disagree. I don't know about how Ryan feels about it. I, I just thought, you know, it looked, I looked at the replay shoulder to shoulder. And granted, you know, we have the benefit of replay and refs don't. But um, I just don't know what a good check is anymore. I mean, those two checks that that got called, I'm like, what? It wasn't like it was an elbow. It wasn't like there was a shot to the head. I just, I mean, what's a hard check anymore? What's a hard, clean check? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I thought the same thing on the one that Saratori got called for in the first period. I mean, you watch NHL games or, you know, and it, he hit the guy hard and Saratori hits guys hard. Sorry, that's what he does. And, I mean, the, he got called right away. And even that one, it seemed like they're almost debating it. And, again, he just hit the guy hard against the glass. And, yeah, when he hits guys, it's going to be loud. And I don't know if that influenced it or what. But, you know, like we talked about, what was it, the North Dakota series, just the inconsistency on things. I mean, I'm fine if you want to be ticky-tack or whatever for a series. If that's just how, you know, ref A and ref B want to be. But it's just the inconsistency where some things get called and the other things don't. And it's just all over the map. And again, it's, you know, I didn't buy into the whole, you know, WCHA referees are garbage thing, mainly because it started from Grand Forks and I usually go the other way or whatever those people think. But I'm totally on board with that now after the last few years. I mean, it's, you know, getting worse by the weekend, it almost seems. And again, it's not just because it impacts the Gophers in this particular case. Um, you know, there was stuff on Mankato that I don't think should have been called. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, kind of wrecked the game and made there's no flow and, you know, constant, you know, special teams play and just, you know, it just made for the product really poor when it definitely wasn't a game that was, you know, out of hand or something like that where there needs to be a lot of stuff called or, you know, guys taking, you know, big time runs at each other or something like that where it's like, okay, I can understand why there's been a lot of penalties. So, um, again, it just, you know, kind of ruined the game on Saturday night and made it borderline unwatchable. And, you know, hopefully we, uh, from a gopher standpoint, we don't have that crew again anytime soon. Well, it was definitely entertaining for me being in the photo box in that third period because, you know, when I went back and watched it on television, it, uh, FSN didn't really do justice to how mad Don Lucia was. So, <laughs> and that may have been a good thing, I guess. So beyond you know that, that, oh wait, go ahead. Hey, I was I was, was going to say, you know that Friday, the tying goal that you know there's a big pile up in front of them. I saw a lot of Gopher fans online, you know, complaining that that was a you know that shouldn't have counted or whatever. But honestly, if you look at the replay of that play, um, Bukestad checked the Mankato player end up Patterson, and that was a legit you know non call. Well, so, I I would agree with that. That I, I you know at first when you see it, you're kind of like, oh, that was kind of strange, but. You know, it, it was pretty clear that he checked him. It, it altered his trajectory. He went into the goalie. Uh, Patterson couldn't get up. It was a legit goal. I, I, I completely agree with you there. But to me, the irony of it is then Bukestad the next night gets the goalie interference penalty in the first period. And I swear to God, if you look at the replay, he didn't even touch the goalie until he got checked into him. I mean, he was a good two feet away before he got checked into him. And it's like... How do you interfere with the goalie when you're checked? I mean, how is it one night it's not a penalty or not, you know, it's a non-call, and the next day you're given a, a penalty? It's like it's like Ryan's saying, there's no consistency at all. So beyond the bad refing, mostly on Saturday night, are there any players for the Gophers that stood out for you or any players that disappointed you on the weekend? Uh, I, you know, we've kind of ragged on him a little bit, but I actually thought Ambrose had a relatively solid weekend. I mean, when you consider that... You know, it was Mankato's pretty uh, pretty penalized team, and so are the Gophers. And, you know, he only had the one minor for the weekend, which is, you know, pretty good for him the way he's been kind of taking penalties. And, um, you know, he got a, a goal and assist on Saturday night. He's contributing, and I, I like the way that he's uh, 
played, you know, around the net. And, you know, maybe he's adjusting a little bit better to, to uh, the college game. So I thought that, you know, for all the grief we've kind of given him, uh, you know, that he deserved a little bit of props for how he played this weekend. Yeah, and I'll go with uh, Ben Marshall, and especially on Friday night. I know, I mean, he drew a couple penalties, and, you know, it seemed like the team on Friday night in general, and maybe it's just a byproduct of how Mankato was playing him, but they just were taking everything wide, and they'd pull into the zone and do that Geno Geyer thing where they just pull up, and, you know, they weren't driving to the net like they need to, and you saw Marshall do that a couple times on the, you know, the left side there, and I think it was once during the first period, and then again during the third, and he drew a penalty both times, and, um, you know, like, you know, I asked Lucia about it after the game because he really, you know, stood out to me, and I liked the term Lucia used where he said he had a lot of dash to his game I think that's a great way to put it just you know even in his own end where he can you know kind of do pirouettes and spin out of trouble and you know start the breakout or you know just get around that first four checker and maybe it's you know part of it too is this we haven't had a guy like that in so long you know I think people on GPL have kind of said he's you know kind of what we thought Aaron Ness would be and we just never saw that you know electricity of for lack of a better term out of Ness but with Marshall you get it every night and you know he had one assist on the weekend he was a plus one both nights so again like Hammond alluded to a few weeks ago the points aren't really you know coming a lot for him like maybe we thought they would and part of that student Nate Schmidt really stepping up and um, you know quarterbacking the top power play unit when you know, maybe there was some thought that Marshall could be that guy before uh, Schmidt really emerged but yeah I think Marshall on the back end and I think you know he's a smaller guy and you maybe worry a little bit about you know the second half of the year being a freshman and maybe worrying out a little bit but um, I think with his skating and just you know his hockey sense in general I think uh, you know big things from him to come both in the second half of this year and you know down the road as well. I think that he's a lot better defensively than some of the fans give him credit for. I mean, you know, he's made some mistakes, and, I mean, we all remember, like, when he got burned in Duluth, and, and uh, you know, and I, like I said, the one on Saturday, he got tripped from behind. There was nothing that he could – I mean, granted, he should have cleared the puck, and a few other guys probably should have cleared it before him, but um, I think that he's, you know, more solid defensively than he gets credit for. I think that it's just that – the few mistakes he has made have been a little bit more, you know, ending up in the back of the net kind of. So, um, but I, I like how he plays overall. And um, I, you know, I talked to you guys about this last week defensively. I mean, how many uh, odd man rushes or breakaways did he give was away? I just week thinking now? about that too. <laughs> you know, what was it like four or five or it, something? Like it that? was pretty lopsided. And, it, and, you know, I mean, what was it at the end of the Saturday game? It was wasn't there a three on one? Yes. It was because oh my Ferguson, gosh! Yeah, and this is where I get back to. There's times that we need to be a little bit more conservative defensively because, you know, when you're ahead, you're protecting a one goal lead. You're not trying to really, you know, blast one from the point on a one timer. You know, with less than a minute left in this, you know, in the game on Saturday, and that of course he fans on and ends up being a three on one the other way. I mean. That's the kind of crap that just annoys the hell out of me. And, and Hull got, uh, you know, he gave up one bad one that I think it was that night. You know, and these guys need to be a little bit more intelligent about when they're doing these things. And, you know, we gave up, you know, the, we're very, very aggressive on the power play. I mean, I noticed watching the game on uh, Saturday just how low, all, you know, four of our guys are just way low. I mean, they're basically circles on and down. And I'm like, it's no wonder, you know, you get some of these breakaways or odd man rushes and shorthanded when you're playing that aggressively. And uh, I just think that they need to be a little bit more careful about some of that stuff. Well, beyond that, do you guys have anything else on the weekend? Four points is good. I mean, that's the bottom line, I guess. And it's hard to say much. I mean, other than because the refs, you know, were such a big part of the Saturday game that, uh, you know, what do you take away from it? I mean, I, we started off pretty good, and then, uh, you know, the refs kind of take over, so you don't really know. You know, when it comes to a special teams game, it's a little bit difficult to judge. Yep. Well, elsewhere in the WCHA, we had Duluth head to Michigan Tech, and they swept the Huskies. Uh, Ryan, any thoughts on that series? Uh, no, I mean, both games were tight, and, you know, you kind of Michigan Tech, we'll talk about them, obviously, in a little bit with them uh, coming out in Mariucci this weekend, but kind of the book on them so far is they've been a little bit tougher at home, and they've been on the road, and, um, you know, they kind of lived up to that this weekend, both the games were pretty close, and, um, but Duluth, again, they're on fire, they haven't lost since the Gopher Series, I think it's, what, 12 game unbeaten streak, and, um, you know, they're the hottest team in the country right now, and they uh, they continued it last weekend against Tech, so what's well, the uh, first of four straight series on the road for them, and uh, so far, so good. 
Yeah, I mean, there's nothing I could really add to that. I mean, you have to, you know, tip your hat to UMD. They played well on the road this last weekend, and, uh, you know, they did what they had to do. I mean, Tech has uh, generally been solid, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that they just don't quite have the offense yet to kind of keep up with teams like uh, Duluth, and uh, hopefully this will, you know, this next weekend they'll have difficulty with us here at uh, Mariucci. Then we have Bemidji taking three points from St. Cloud. Uh, I was a little surprised by that. What about you, Hammy? Yeah, I mean, I, I was very surprised by it. I, I uh, you know, Bemidji hasn't exactly been a you know goal scoring machine, and then all of a sudden they put six up on the board against St. Cloud on Friday, and then they kind of had a more of a grinded out win on a Saturday. And I watched some of the Saturday game, and uh, um, you know. I, St. Cloud is, is a hard team to figure out. I mean, they, you know, part of it you kind of think, um, I didn't see the Friday game, so I don't, I can't really particularly judge, but, you know, you wonder how much of it is, you know, Farragher kind of coming um, down to earth a little bit, not playing, you know, like he was early on, and how much of it is, how much of it is just defensive lapses. You know, I'm sure it's a combination of the two, but, uh, yeah, it's very surprising to see uh, Bemidji go in there and take three points from uh, St. Cloud. St. Cloud had been undefeated, I think, uh, going into the weekend at home. So um, props to uh, Bemidji for that performance. Yeah, I mean, to see, you know, Farragher, obviously, we saw what he did against the Gophers, especially, I mean, obviously the Gophers lit him up on that Saturday night, but, you know, he was awesome that Friday night up there, and, you know, we all know about him going up to North Dakota in his first start and shutting them out, and um, he's been really good for him, but, you know, he, uh, you know, the rose might be off that, you know, the bloom might be off that rose a little bit, considering what they've done, and, um, you know, also, you know, you can't underestimate the loss of LeBlanc. I mean, he was a point-per-game guy, senior captain, and, um, you know, their offense looked fine against the Gophers for the most part. I mean, again, Saturday Saturday night not good, but um, you know it's just that's a tough. You know when you're you know lose a senior like that, it's just a tough thing to replace, and you can maybe cover it up for a little while. But um, you know the deeper into the year it gets, the tougher it is to you know kind of cover up those key injuries. So um, yeah, that's definitely a tough weekend home for St. Cloud. It just seems defensively as a team, that Motsko's teams for whatever reason, if their goalie's not playing out of their skull, they just seem to have problems. I mean they've never really been, I think. A, real solid defensive team. So, I mean, uh, I guess the camp, it's, if your goalie's not playing as well as Farragher was early on, they're going to give up some goals. Then we have Denver at CC, and CC wins in overtime with a penalty shot, which was definitely a highlight real goal. I didn't see the call that caused the penalty shot, but I did see the highlight of the, of the game-winning goal. Ryan, do you know what happened there? Yeah, I mean, the, I don't even want to pronounce the kid's name. We'll call him Alexander K. But he, uh, it was a legit call. I mean, maybe in overtime I could see the refs swallowing the whistle a little bit. But if you're a CC fan and that doesn't get called, um, you're going to be pretty upset. I mean, he was in, I, you know, kind of was leaning in, I believe, you know, to get the, you know, the edge and pretty much a breakaway. And the Denver kid took him down. And I think even after Gwazdecki said it was the right call and that, you know, he didn't really have a huge problem with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big win for CC. I mean, they had lost at Denver a few weeks ago, and, um, you know, they did the single-game deal that weekend and then also this weekend, so kind of weird. But they, you know, of course, you know, swept at North Dakota, so, you know, you come home against a big rival, and that game can kind of be a tipping point. Um, you know, but Joe Howe got back in the net, and he was, you know, pretty solid, obviously. Only all three goals to Denver, and Denver had 30-plus shots. And then, you know, um, you know the big line for CC, at least, you know, those guys didn't score any goals. So anytime, you know, they can score four goals and the Schwartz brothers don't score any of them, um, you know, you got to figure they're going to have a pretty good chance to win. So, yeah, again, it was a big win for CC. And, um, you know, for Denver, again, it's, it's just tough sledding right now. They have the, you know, third string, the finish kid in net. And, you know, again, I haven't seen him play a lot, but um, he's one three and two on the year and again you know it's the third string guy if the gophers had to play kramer and that you know i don't think we'd be expecting a lot and it would be you know a pretty tough goal so again until denver gets you know murray back or britain you know it's just you don't want to say it's a lost season or anything because they still definitely have a shot but um you know they're definitely behind the eight ball with the goaltending injuries i kind of went the a little bit of the opposite try and said it on twitter i thought it was very borderline to call a penalty shot and at least in overtime i could see maybe doing that uh, you know, I know some people don't like the, uh, you know, a call should be the same no matter what part of the game it's in. But for me, uh, Crucial Niski is the guy's last name. Um, he, uh, you know, certainly he had an opportunity that was negated. It should have been a penalty, of course, but penalty shot. And I don't know. It was a it was a very entertaining game. I watched, I don't, I don't know, at least the third period in overtime and uh, I think some of the second period. But it was a very entertaining 
Zucker looked really good. You know, Wild fans are obviously going to, you know, have a lot to uh, look forward to with that guy. And uh, there was some good plays. I mean, I didn't really, you know, both sides, they just played very good, you know, open hockey, and I really liked the game. So uh, props to those two teams for an entertaining game. And uh, we'll see how it, you know, affects CC. I'm sure that, uh, you know, it was a big positive for them to come out with uh, such a entertaining victory in the way it, it was kind of dramatic. So. And with that penalty shot, too, I don't know if the refs, you know, were kind of quick on their feet and considering their WCHA officials, I'm guessing not. But, I mean, that call <laughs> happened with, well, that call happened with a minute 14 left in overtime, so it would have essentially been a half power play as well for CC. So, again, I don't know if that factored into it, but, I mean, I could see the refs, you know, maybe they did see that and were like, well, it's only really going to be a minute and change of a power play. It's not like it was a minute into overtime where, you know, they had a bunch of time. So, again, I don't know if that factored in, but like Cammy said, I mean, it was close, and I guess you could argue it kind of either way yeah, i think you're giving the refs too much credit probably <laughs> yeah <laughs> north dakota goes to anchorage and gets a, a a rare sweep i mean i don't recall them getting too many sweeps up there in the last five six years yeah i mean i have to you know give them credit they think they've won five of the last six and their offense has certainly been much uh, better in recent weeks uh, against cc and then this last weekend their power plays clicking pretty well and uh you know, maybe they'll actually prove me wrong and actually show uh, that they're going to be a player in the second half of the season. But uh, you, you certainly have to give them credit. They're playing a lot better hockey overall. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's some of it, you know, I don't know if, like we talked about, CC being kind of weak in Grand Forks and a little bit iffy defensively and Anchorage is kind of up and down. And, you know, I don't know if it's a competition thing. You know, I think it's probably a combination of factors, but you have to give your you know, tip your hat to uh, North Dakota for, uh, you know, a nice streak of uh, wins. Yeah, and I think the key for them, I mean, we you know, all talked about how they've struggled offensively and they've kind of come out of that, but I mean, you look back at their last handful of games and aside from that, you know, they beat CC 7-6, you know, a few Fridays ago, but they've been allowing, you know, 1-2 and on occasion 3 goals a night, so it seems like they've kind of got their back end sorted out and then, you know, up front, I mean, they scored 5 power play goals last weekend and the you know, we, again, we talked last week about that big line and how they broke it up against the Gophers but they've been back together with, you know, Corbin Knight in between Brock Nelson and Danny Cristo and I think Brock Nelson is up to 14 goals, I think, on the year, and a lot of those have come on the power play. So, um, you know, North Dakota, if they can, you know, get that kind of production out of their first line and get, you know, the kind of defense and goaltending that a lot of people thought they'd get, you know, at the start of the year, um, you know, they could definitely be a dangerous team. And it's been huge for them to, you know, get a handful of wins prior to the Christmas break. I mean, you know, we've seen it with the Gophers at times where, you know, you struggle late in the first half and, you know, it's you almost it's not an afterthought, but, you know, it's almost the end of the first half, Christmas and everything else. But these games are important and you don't want to have to climb that mountain starting in January if they can, you know, get something rolling here. So four straight wins and then, uh, you know, you figure they host Omaha this weekend, probably have a good chance to get at least one or two more. Well, Ryan, you kind of joked about this last week, but it turned out to be somewhat true. UNO goes to Alabama Huntsville and splits. Uh, <laughs> we kind of joked about it last week, but you may have been on to something. Yeah, I mean, well, now in hindsight, I, hindsight, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it may have come off as a joke, but I was 100, no. I, you know, if you're Omaha, I mean, what do you say? I mean, what Omaha or Huntsville's 40% of their last five wins have come against you. Um, but even in the game where, you know, Omaha lost down there, what was it, 3-1? Three, three I mean, Omaha had 45 shots and Huntsville had 17. And again, it uh, seems like the goaltending thing kind of let them down that night. He gave up three goals on 17 shots. So, um, you know, Omaha, again, they've been a lot more inconsistent than I thought they'd be this year. I thought they'd be a, you know, pretty solid top four type team. But again, when we've seen it with Denver and if your goaltending is in disarray, um, it doesn't matter how many shots you put up and everything else when the, you know, every time you have to kind of watch with one eye when the other team's, you know, on the offense. So um, not good for them. And, uh, you know, like I said, heading up to Grand Forks this weekend, they probably could have used some more momentum. Any thoughts on it, Hammy? Uh, you know, nothing that I... I think it's entertaining a little bit that it's for UNO. It's that's the goalie thing, you know. I mean, it, three goals and what was I think it was like seventeen shots or something like that. I mean, it's just it's the inconsistency that they face, and uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they perform up in uh, you know the Meek Reiner in Grand Forks this weekend. Uh, you know, I'm sure with the momentum that uh, the Sioux have. Well, I guess they're not the Sioux anymore, but. Uh, the, the momentum that UND or North Dakota or whatever their nickname is going to be eventually, uh, we'll see how they can handle it. 
Well, let's get straight to it then. Uh, this week we've got UNO heading to Grand Forks and to play the Fighting Flicker Tales. Uh, what do you think, Cammy? I mean, obviously <laughs> you haven't been happy with UNO's goaltending, and that could definitely come into play this weekend. Well, you know, it just seems like whatever North, or you know, when Nebraska Omaha is playing, it just seems like you know they have one bad game and then one good game pretty much every weekend. I mean, I think that other than uh, when they were up in Alaska uh, early in the season, I think they've generally come out of uh, each weekend with at least one win. So, I mean, I would kind of expect that trend to continue. I think that one of those nights, North Dakota will probably you know beat them by a couple goals minimum. And then I'm sure that, you know, the next night, maybe the Saturday night game, you know, UNO comes back and uh, plays well and gets a victory. But uh, that, so I'm kind of, I'm thinking that that series is going to be a, a split, but I won't be the least bit surprised if North Dakota sweeps it. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to figure that Blaze, I mean, that's obviously, you know, he went back there last year with, you know, Omaha, but so it's not his first time back or anything like that, but um, it still probably means more to him, and he's going to have him, you know, ready to go, I think, for at least one of the games, but um, yeah, I mean, I'll say three points for North Dakota. Just, again, their back end right now is um, pretty solid, especially when you compare it to the, you know, turbulence that Omaha is dealing with in goal, and, you know, I just don't know how, I mean, Omaha does have some solid forwards up front, but I just don't know, they don't have anybody as high end as a Brock Nelson or a Chris so I think those guys will kind of shine through and keep it uh, keep it going for the Sioux. And we've got Denver heading to Bemidji State. See, yeah, this, this go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was going to say this kind of I don't know this could be trouble for Denver. I mean, Bemidji kind of got it going last weekend in St. Cloud and. Um, you know, Bemidji's going to have the goaltending edge unless, again, I haven't seen if Murray's going to be back anytime soon. But uh, I don't know. This one feels kind of weird for Denver in that, you know, they're definitely favored, but they're going up under the, you know, into that barn and small ice sheet and everything else. And I can see Bemidji kind of, you know, playing that tough defensive style and kind of bottling them up. So I'll say a split. I think uh, Bemidji can hang in there with them one of the nights and uh, take a couple points from them. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to say the same exact thing. I mean, I it's hard for me right now to uh, get on the Denver bandwagon. They've been kind of so up and down this year that um, you'd kind of like to see a little bit of consistency there before you kind of go betting on them to uh, really do well on the road. And, uh, you know, from what they really haven't been on the road, they've been on the road less than UMD has up to this point. I mean, they have had five road games and only three of them have been in WCHA play and they – you know, they lost and tied at Tech, and, of course, they lost last weekend at Colorado College, so they're, they haven't been great on the road, you know, in the few games they've had in WCHA, so um, I, I won't be the least bit surprised if Bemidji comes out of that series with at least two points. Anchorage heads to the Colorado Springs to take on the Tigers. Uh, this could get ugly. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't have the stats in front of me on Anchorage and what they've done on the road, but, I mean, they, you know, did pretty well at Mankato um, a few weekends ago. But outside of that, I mean, they've really, really struggled, you know, basically all year, um, you know, and, this, again, scoring goals. And it seems like CC, I mean, again, they've, you know, had the kind of the blip up at North Dakota, but um, it just feels like CC with their offense and, um, you know, they kind of got it going again last weekend in Denver. And I'd be pretty surprised if it was anything other than a CC sweep. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, um, Anchorage has lost nine of its last 12 games. And, uh, I mean, they had the one weekend at uh, Mankato that was a pretty solid um, performance. But uh, overall, they just have not been all that impressive uh, ever since those first couple series in the beginning of the season. So uh, I definitely expect Colorado College to come out of that series uh, with two wins and probably a number of goals. Then we have the red-hot Duluth Bulldogs heading to Madison. And, Obviously, we know the, the Badgers have been pretty bad on the road, but at home, they've been pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is a kind of a tough one to pick. I mean, UMD, you know, of course, has been very hot, and you kind of say the law of averages is at some point it's going to end, especially on the road um, in a road series. And I think it's definitely in Wisconsin's favor that they've had the week off last week to kind of, you know, rest up and get some fresh legs and, um, prepare for this, you know, series. And I'm sure, you know, they usually have pretty good crowds and uh, they'll be amped up to have the number one ranked team in, in their rank. And uh, as we saw when we were there, um, you know, they uh, played pretty well on that Friday 
uh, game. So I kind of expect this series to be a split. Um, I do think Wisconsin will rise up and at least win one of the games. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be pretty – I'd be surprised if it's not a pretty wide-open series because Duluth likes to play that way. And I know that Wisconsin tends to try to slow things down against that type of a team. But uh, I think Duluth will kind of end up sucking them into that kind of a game. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I think I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but I thought Duluth had a pretty wild series out there. I think it was last year because wasn't Duluth the start of the year some sort of bit where they won all those games in overtime and I think maybe one and I think maybe even two of them were out at Wisconsin. So it seems like they've played some kind of crazy games together. But yeah, I mean, if you're Wisconsin, it's going to, you know, they don't have the depth up front, but, you know, their top line has been really good this year with Zengerly and Barnes and those guys, you know, they've got, a, they're starting to get a little bit of depth up there. But again, it doesn't compare to what Duluth has. So, I mean, I think if Wisconsin, if these games get into a shootout, I just don't really like Wisconsin's chances. Um, you know, uh, Duluth has the edge in that, of course, with Ryder. He's been really good this year. And Wisconsin, again, they've been good at home but um, a couple of freshmen and neither one's really, you know, grabbed the reins so far. So, um, you know, I'll say probably a split, but again, it, it wouldn't shock me if Duluth came out of there with four points. They're just playing really well right now. And, um, you know, I just don't know if Wisconsin's got the offense. I mean, I think Duluth's going to get four each night, and I just don't know if Wisconsin's going to be able to match them. I believe the Friday game is on the Big Ten Network, if anyone's interested in watching that one. Hmm. Um, well, could be a snoozer. Huntsville heads to Mankato. Did you guys even bother picking that? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I didn't. But I mean, I, this is one of those. I mean, we joked about it a few weeks ago. What's the crowd going to be like for this one? I mean, it, it, it's one thing when you're playing a league game against uh, Anchorage, but you know, at least there's something kind of tangible that you're trying to achieve with that. But wow, I mean, this is probably going to be a pretty dull one. And I would imagine, you know, based on what I saw this last week, and I think. Um, you know, Mankato will probably win both games, and uh, you know they look. I, I, I do think that they're going to be a better team in the second half, and uh, certainly from a Gopher standpoint, I'll be rooting them on simply because it helps our, you know, overall ability in the pairwise and all that kind of good stuff. So I mean, um, go Mankato. Yeah, will there be more people in the arena or more people at Mettler's? That would be. I wow. think it's kind of a coin flip, but. Uh, no, I mean, Huntsville's awful. They've won one game all year. They were terrible last year. It's a program that's going to be dead in a half season. I mean, you hate to say it, but it's true. And, um, yeah, Mankato shouldn't really have any issues, uh, you know, rolling through them this weekend. But you see that uh, North Dakota's picking up the goalie. I mean, they're already the carcass isn't even dead, and they're picking at the at the meat, man. So their, their goalie is going to be heading up to North Dakota, I guess, next year. So that's interesting. And, of course, now we've got Michigan Tech heading to Mariucci this weekend. Uh, the overall series, Minnesota leads 171, 76, and 15. Um, the last 10 meetings, Minnesota is 8, 1, and 1 against the Huskies, and it looks like they've won the last seven. Last time they lost was a 6-5 overtime loss in Houghton, which <laughs> ended up knocking the Gophers out of the NCAA tournament when it came down to pairwise numbers. So, But it's been a while. Uh, Ryan, what do you think? I mean, Tech's supposedly a little better this year, but uh, Minnesota's handled them pretty well lately. Yeah, and, you know, obviously Tech has improved, but, um, you know, like we've kind of alluded to throughout the podcast, I mean, a lot of those, um, you know, doing better has come at home. I mean, they swept Wisconsin, which, you know, granted, Wisconsin's not great this year, but anytime you can sweep Wisconsin, that's a good thing. And, you know, they had three points from Denver, and they split with Mankato. And so, again, a lot of their, you know, doing better has come at home. And, um, you know, that makes sense. I mean, it's not the easiest place to go and play in, in the sense that, you know, it's a small rink, it's a dead building, you know, it's a crappy trip for teams i'm sure most teams don't you know like denver i think they what fly to chicago and then bus there i think or fly to minneapolis i mean just a total nightmare and it's tough to get up for the games but um you know just in kind of looking at things for the little gpl preview i do each week it just seems that you know on the back end they're a little bit stronger and offensively they're still kind of challenged which makes sense it's probably a little bit easier to improve defensively um with a new coaching staff than it is to create offense um, so we'll see. I mean, they're going to come here to the big ice and, you know, that's traditionally been something that you can kind of tell this in watching the teams that, you know, man, or excuse me, that, you know, Michigan tech doesn't have the skaters that the Gophers do. And, you know, but I think for the Gophers and we've talked about it all year that you know, the thing, and again, last weekend was a little bit skewed by the refereeing, but 
Um, the Gophers just got to stay out of the penalty box. You know, last Saturday jacked up their numbers, but I mean, they're second in the league in penalty minutes. And, um, you know, that's the one thing this weekend where, you know, you could see them get in trouble. And it's what happened Saturday against Mankato when, you know, Mankato didn't have a lot of five on five offense, but they scored a couple power play goals due in large part to having, what, eight, nine power plays. So a team like Tech that, you know, isn't going to score a lot, but if you give them five, six, seven power plays, um, you know, logic says they might get one or two. And then, you know, they're probably, you know, yeah, it'd be nice if they go. Gophers absolutely lit them up one night, but I mean, the Gopher offense isn't, you know, clicking in all cylinders right now. So, um, you know, I think if the Gophers stay out of the box this weekend and, you know, just play their game and, you know, hopefully use their speed and be aggressive and go, you know, instead of, like I said earlier, you know, going around the net, cut to it, you know, draw penalties, be aggressive, play on their toes. Um, you know, again, it should be another four point weekend. Yeah. I mean, I, the way that I look at this weekend is it's probably going to be similar to what we've seen with uh, some other teams that we've in Mariucci where they've kind of, you know, like the Vermont series and, and this last weekend where, um, you know, that second game for Vermont, you know, they really tried to, you know, kind of muck it up and be a little bit more of a grinded out type of game, even though there was a pretty good amount of goals. And I think that um, Mankato kind of tried to play it along those same lines. And I kind of expect that, kind of a series this weekend I, I think that a lot of people probably look at and think well you know uh you know gophers are more talented we should pretty much beat them by two goals a night at minimum and um i really don't kind of expect that kind of a series i think it's going to be a little bit more hard fought kind of like this last weekend against mankato i do think that we'll win both games but um i actually expect it to be a little bit more of a struggle um Tex actually got a pretty solid power play they're around 20 percent and their penalty kill is not the greatest so um, you know, if they do take some penalties, uh, hopefully the Gophers will be able to capitalize on that. But from a depth standpoint and uh, offensively, and I'm sure, you know, Patterson's playing, played all right. I mean, he didn't have the greatest weekend, but he didn't play terribly this last weekend. So uh, um, I expect the Gophers to sweep, but I do think it'll be a pretty hard-fought series. I'm going with the Gophers sweep. They're going to win big Friday night, and we're going to see the backup goaltender on Saturday. Really? Oh. I'm just going with it. Well, uh, you've been pretty good with your bold predictions this year, so <laughs> who knows? Maybe you've got some inside uh, insight. I've got no play. insight. I just pull it right on my butt. <laughs> well, how about recruiting news, Hammy? Anything going on there? Uh, well, in the last week, we picked up uh, a name that's pretty familiar to a longtime Gopher fans. Uh, Jake Bischoff from uh, Grand Rapids committed to the Gophers. Uh, everybody kind of probably remembers his dad, Grant, playing for the Gophers kind of in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, who was very talented and uh, did very well. But uh, Jake's a defenseman that plays at Grand Rapids. He's a uh, pretty skilled, mobile, uh, smart, uh, very uh, intelligent player, uh, um, poised. And I, I really think that he's going to be one of those guys that uh, is you know, a three-, four-year type of a kid that's going to really – paid dividends, especially as an upperclassman. Uh, I think he's very smart. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, Gensel was up there, uh, you know, a few days before Bischoff actually committed. And so, uh, you know, it's I think it's a good sign. And, and I, we talked about it a little bit on GPL. You, you know, when you come to these uh, kind of legacy recruits, you know, it's always nice to see some of these kids uh, joining the program. And, you know, he's definitely – qualified he had, was looking at uh, Duluth and Notre Dame among some other schools and that uh, you know so it's a good thing and he like I said on GPL he he won't be the last legacy that's going to be in the program in the next you know four or five years so we'll see more to the, of that to come now are we getting way too many defensemen here it seems like we are well I mean in we're this getting case, really heavy I mean uh how well many, he's we, not going to be around I'd say more than likely he's not going to be around until 2014. I mean, he's uh, only a junior this year, so he's not going to graduate until um, 2013. And I highly doubt he's going to be coming, you know, right away because our numbers right now, we do have, you know, we only have, as far as graduation goes, we're only going to be losing Helgeson after next year. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, maybe there'll be a guy or two that, might leave you don't you never know but uh yeah we're pretty stocked and uh you know i was thinking about it today looking at some of these defensemen and some of these mistakes you know some of these veteran guys they're gonna have to watch out because there's gonna be a lot more competition next year for playing time and, and there's some talent coming in with guys like uh brady shea they're not going to be able to you know continually screw up and expect to continually be put in the lineup so they better uh, clean up some of these mistakes but the only recruiting news I have is that I 
witnessed all three Riley brothers at the game Saturday night. That's all I got. Uh, they were they Ryle, were they, they were here with a visitor and or they were here on a visit. And, you know, went into the locker room after the game, got to hear all the country music they love to play in the locker room after the game, and looks like they left with Rao and maybe showing them the town. But uh, that's the extent of my recruiting knowledge. Excellent. It's always good to have those tips. <laughs> so, anything else? Uh, no? Probably touch on the World Junior thing. You know, oh, you that's know, right. With, uh, you know, not a surprise that um, Bugsett is named to the preliminary roster, and really not a surprise that Rao was either. Obviously, Rao, you know, wasn't on the team last year, but in Bugsett was. But um, you know, given the way Rao started off this year, um, I, mean, I know they. I can't remember. I know they've changed it in recent years, but you know, it's the preliminary roster, and you'd have to think that Bugsett's a lock, and that Rao, um, again, you know, with his unique skill set, and that you know, he's obviously a goal scorer and a smaller kid that. Um, you have to think he has a pretty good chance of making it, um, but I think they would do the cut down here in a few weeks. So we'll see. Uh, you know, from a Gopher standpoint, you'd almost rather not have Rao go, just because again, I mean, we've seen guys kind of go up there, and it's nice to you know, obviously you get beat up, and I think it is in Canada again this year, so at least the travel isn't you know coming from Sweden or something like that. But um, at the same time, you know, it'd be nice to have him back here, obviously playing for the Gophers. But again, when every time you have a chance to, you know, it's cliched, but it's totally true. If you have a chance to represent your country, you need to be all for it so um in the u.s you know like most years you know now it seems like on paper they have a pretty good chance to um you know take it all so you know either way it's uh it's gonna be good for the gophers no matter you know which of the two probably both end up uh, representing the country yeah i'm not going to claim to be an expert on all these players that are up for the team but i the, of, of the guys that i see on there defensively i get a little bit concerned about uh you know our chances uh, you know uh, they got some young guys they've got some guys that in my opinion, are you know not quite as good as we've seen with some of these past USA teams. So um, we'll see how it goes. I think up front will be good, and I'm sure net will be good. But uh, I'm a little bit concerned about the de- the defensive team USA. I guess we'll see how it goes. Well, I think for that too, the big kind of the linchpin there is Justin Falk, and you know we saw how good he was for Duluth last year. And he's been you know pretty much a regular for Carolina. I don't know if he's logging top four type minutes and you know they're not you know a great team and we've seen instances in the past where you know guys have you know played you know at a young age for NHL teams and kind of been I think Falk spent a little bit of time in the minors but just you know kind of that you know fringe player and it's almost beneficial long term especially for a team like Carolina who's not going anywhere this year recently fired their coach um, to let a kid like that go and excel at the world juniors versus playing you know maybe a limited a limited role for them you know again long term that's probably going to be more beneficial and um, especially for the U.S. I mean, if you can get Falk, I mean, he'd be a, obviously a top four guy and one of the best, you know, offensive defensemen in the tournament. So hopefully uh, for the U.S. to say Carolina uh, lets him uh, lets him head out with the boys. Okay, not a college or WCHA topic, but I'd love to get your thoughts on the restructuring of the NHL divisions. I'm, well, I, mean, I am ecstatic about it. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned it on Twitter, and to me it's great because – you know, I just remember back in the '80s going to the Met Center and seeing the North Stars playing the Blackhawks, and you know, and when Detroit would come in with Iserman, and you know, some of these, you know, even the Blues were usually pretty uh, testy games and whatever. So, I mean, the fact that you know we're going to be able to see some of these teams regularly here again, I think that's great, and it kind of will bring a lot of older fans kind of some good memories from back in the. 80s, 90s, you know, that was a great time in hockey around here. And I think that, uh, of course, the time zone thing, I mean, we see it tonight. The, the Wilds start at 930 out in the West Coast. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people probably aren't going to be up to watch most of the game. So it's going to be a big boon for them, of course, television-wise as well. It looks like uh, Harding <laughs> is out as well, too. Oh, is that right? I, I just saw, I saw a tweet about that earlier. It looks like they're playing their third goaltender right now. Hackett is in for the wild right now some kind of hmm. neck injury to harding so well i know my buddy was texting me during it and they were outshot 20 or the shots were like 22 to 4 at one point but now they are 23 to 10 but the wild are winning 2-1 so well that's good i guess <laughs> yeah we'll see if uh the uh, hackett kid can keep it up because he's uh, he can he's hack saying, it oh, wah, wah. Wah, wah. 
But uh, yeah, like you guys said, I mean, I don't, I haven't heard anyone really, uh, you know, complain about the uh, the new realignment. I know, you know, probably the Florida teams um, kind of get dicked the most, just in you know having to play all the Canadian teams and have a lot of travel up there and go through customs and that whole deal. So I guess they kind of get screwed, but big picture wise, and for the fans. Um, you know, you have to be happy with it. And I think the playoff the deal is the coolest thing where, um, you know, again, you're going to have somebody in one conference that has, you know, 80 points and they're going to make the playoffs, whereas somebody in another conference is going to have 90 and they're not going to make it. Just, you know, again, that's kind of the nature of it each year. And But you see that in other sports. I mean, last year, the, you know, NFC West winner in the NFL makes it. And, um, you know, but they, you know, they made it and they won a game and almost won another one. So, um, you know, those teams are deserving and that's going to happen. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. And I think, especially for the wild, I mean, they kind of, you know, want to, you know, obviously these things can change, especially long term, but they, you know, they got in a pretty favorable conference. I think they're not in there with a bunch of teams that are, you know, perennially ass kickers. I mean, obviously Detroit, but, you know, Chicago was horrible five years ago. And outside of that, everyone else in there is kind of, you know, Nashville, Columbus, you know, Winnipeg. These aren't teams that you really fear a lot. So from a wild standpoint, I think, uh, you know, it definitely benefits them. I was never a big Vancouver rivalry fan anyway. I mean, we had, you know, we had that series, you know, years ago. But uh, I'm kind of like you guys. I grew up in the 80s watching the North Stars. And, you whoa, know, whoa, it, whoa, it, whoa. It, who grew up in the 80s? Well, I grew yeah. up watching hockey in the 80s. You know, it started oh, okay. back in, in, well, for me, for the North Stars, well, I think it was the 81 season, that big season that they played, that that was kind of my introduction to hockey back then. So, and I always remember it. I love the interconference playoff matches. And then you move on to play the, you know, the, the other side of the conference. And uh, I think one interesting twist though, is I wouldn't mind seeing them rotate which conference plays, which conference in the semifinals. I think yeah, that'd be, yeah. I think that'd be an interesting twist. If, you know, instead of the two Western conferences playing, you know, mix them up. Maybe, maybe the Western conference plays the Northeastern conference or, or something like that. in the summer, just kind of mix it up a little bit. That's, that's something interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing. Yeah. I honestly, I, all I really focused on was the, the, uh, the conference changes. I, I didn't really think, you know, listen to any of the, uh, the playoff stuff for me. I mean, I'm along the same lines as you that. I grew up, you know, with the North Stars, you know, especially in the 80s and uh, going to Met Center and seeing them play those teams. And I remember uh, Johnny Bianchi, you know, the, the Bianchi boys, uh, their dad used to work the penalty yep. box at, yep. at uh, the Met Center. And him and my dad kind of grew up together. I remember him giving me a puck at one of the games and just like those kinds of memories, you know, with against those teams. And uh, I've always felt like, you know, it just hasn't had the same zest. I mean, I don't care about Vancouver. I mean, I've never have. I know that we've had the Bertuzzi stuff and all that other kind of crap, and but it just hasn't been the same in Colorado, and it's, these teams don't mean anything to me. And so to have these uh, these teams that we grew up with just finally be playing us regularly again, it'll be a great thing. I'll be real excited. Well, I think some of it also has to do that the North Stars are gone. You know, it was – it was more of a romantic type of thing back then. And it's just not as exciting now that it's the wild. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, I don't follow the wild like I follow the North Stars. So I think this conference shift will actually kind of help reintroduce me to the NHL again. I can see your point. I mean, I think, you know, the only difference probably is, is between the wild and the North Stars for us is for people of our age is that we grew up you know, with the North stars and I'm sure, you know, for kids these days, you know, the teenagers or whatever, you know, the North stars are just kind of like, it's almost like black and white film was for us, you know, watching football teams of the (laughs) sixties, you know, the Vikings of the sixties didn't mean diddly to us, you know, when we were teenagers. So, I mean, I'm sure it's kind of the same concept for them, but I think, you know, when when I think Blackhawks, I mean, I think Cicerelli and Al Secord, you know, you know, Dino sucks and Secord sucks and, you know, their crowd got on our guys and vice versa. And it was just, you know, it was a great rivalry. And I'm just looking forward to hopefully seeing those things kind of get recharged again. And that's where I think this will happen. I think you know, it'll help maybe bring some of those old fans back because we'll be seeing those teams a lot more often instead of, you know, once or twice a year. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess with that, I mean, I'm kind of will agree with Sid on that. I think it's just about winning. I mean, I think if you're the Wild and they're, you know, consistently winning and, <clears throat> you know, this year, obviously, you know, so far they have, but it's been, you know, more or less a struggle. They've had a couple of runs, but I just think if you're winning, it doesn't really matter who you're playing. I mean, when they were winning in against Vancouver, everyone is, you know, head over heels into that rivalry and loved it. But again, I think where it'll help is when the Wild aren't that good and, you know, Chicago comes to town, it's going to be a lot better than if the Wild aren't good and Edmonton's here. So I think it'll help when, you know, the Wild do have the down years versus, you know, how much it'll help when they have the really good years. All right, guys. Any other thoughts on uh, either the NHL, the week, this weekend, and the WCHA or anything like that? Uh, the only thing I, I was going to, so we're not going to have, you know, for the listeners, we're not going to have, uh, obviously, a series to preview next week. So what, what did you think, Jupe, the plan was going to be for a podcast next week? Well, actually, I was thinking we could just do a quick little, you know, we'll do a review, maybe a quick preview of the Mariucci Classic, and then take like a month off. <laughs> And you know, well, I think it'd be a good idea to kind of look back on the first half yeah, as well, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to kind of alert people to that, that, you know, we'll still have something at least for next week, even though we don't have a series to really preview the following weekend. And, and we did have some feedback this week, but it was all about that whole Twitter crap that was going on, and I'm not even going to bother going into it. So uh, any final thoughts, guys? Nope, not for me. Got nothing. All right. And Ryan, I assume you'll be on this week on KFAN Thursday morning? Yep. Thursday, uh, Thursday at 9.55. And you can also follow Ryan at, uh, at Ryan Cardle on Twitter. And then, of course, you can also follow Hammy on Twitter at Hammy Hockey. Uh, just remember, you can always send us feedback. Uh, the best way is through our email at podcast at gopherpucklive.com. Or if you're listening live, you can always... Uh, Send us a tweet at gopherpucklive.com. And that about does it for this week. Thanks for listening in, and we'll see you next time on the Gopher Puck Live podcast. Mm-hmm.